Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Bob Greenia. I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. And I am here to talk to you today with a microphone, hopefully, if I can get one. <laughs> Hello. No. I'll turn it on. Hello. Okay. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about coherent matter traveling wave beams and their possible role in making strange radiation tracks. If you don't know what strange radiation tracks are, I'm going to give you a couple of links. You can go and research this afterwards. But basically, they were first observed in, before 1992, but put into the Solon patent. I'll just show you what was in that patent. Um, but essentially, it's, it's been 29 years uh, without a, 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 an answer. Okay, and I hopefully, at the end of this presentation, there will be an answer. Okay, just uh, to follow on from the last presentation, I spoke about S.V. Adamenko in my previous presentation at this conference, and uh, this is a very important finding that he had. Uh, don't bother reading it, you can see it in the slides later. But essentially, what you're seeing down there on the bottom right is a little glowing spot and then a not-so-glowing spot after four seconds, with an atomic mass of 400 with an atomic mass of 433. Okay, I get it, slow. Uh, slow? <laughs> so uh, he reported this, I believe, in 2006, and it was one of his accretion disks. Now it is a 10, one-tenth of C discharge of about 300 joules into a target. It is a discharge, therefore it is an exotic vacuum object. An exotic vacuum object is ball lightning. And on the accretion list, a long time afterwards, they put it into a secondary iron mass spectrometer. And they fired a beam at uh, the thing to determine what the elements were. Well, they found a number of spots where they couldn't determine what the element was. And so they've got a limit on their spectrometer, so they know it can't be lighter than 433. I think that's how it works. Anyway, so... Um, but then they thought there was something wrong with the equipment because they couldn't even observe the primary iron. And so they turned it off, and what they observed is what you see down in the bottom right, this glow that then decayed where they were targeting the, the beam. So they turned it on again, and they fired the beam, and they turned it off, and on the photomultiplier, they saw this exponential decay again, again and again and again. They don't know what it was, but the ions that they were firing into it were disappearing and emitting light in an exponential decay. A long time after they did their experiment. Okay, so my plan today is to discuss the methods of coherent matter production, briefly, behavior of balls of fire and in, uh, on and in metals, behavior of observed traces versus, versus witness marks, the product from a dead coherent matter traveling wave beam, I only observe this on Tuesday, so it's very preliminary. And I've got a special treat at the end. Um, what you're seeing on the right is something you can hold in mind. It's the NATO model from Matsumoto at the bottom, uh, which he came up with, but later it concluded that it was ball lightning, a type of ball lightning. And you can see the ones that we observed on the Amasa vibrator blades. So the overall uh, uh, overview of the process is it causes electron bunching. Whatever you need to do to create this, you have to create electron bunching. That leads to coherence and monopole production. Then you get self-organization of that coherent monopoles and the coherent matter. And then you have to pump it with energy. Uh, it, if you pump it enough, you'll get more interesting uh, nuclear reactions uh, via the self-collapse. And then you get production of strange radiation post-collapse and disruption. It kicks out these particles. And then observation of witness marks and dead uh, material is how traditionally people have observed this. They've only ever been able to see what it did to a piece of material somewhere else in their lab or in their apparatus or in their heads. Right, so Lockheed Martin published a patent called Systems and Methods for Generating Coherent Matter Wave Beams. And you can see the conclusion of what it can do. Examples of applications are a more accurate global positioning system, matter wave projectiles and missiles, directed energy weapons, matter wave optics and cloaking. cloaking. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> you can read it in your own time, but it's freaking scary, to be honest. And when you see what, what the bullet is, it's going to scare you too. Um, it, so 
they say in the pattern it's very clear and it was, it was a watershed for my understanding as well. Normally, Bose-Einstein condensates are formed by cooling, say 133 cesium or 23 sodium atoms, to near absolute zero. The purpose of this is to get the same de Broglie wavelength for those single isotopes so that then they will cohere and create a quantum mac uh, macro object. The Lockheed Martin pattern argues that all you need is the same matter type, be it the isotope, for instance, 27 aluminium and even an electron, it's going to freak people. <laughs> At the exact same temperature, the same de Broglie wavelength of the overall mass, in the same phase, and this leads to a matter wave coherence, which can be assisted by employing the 1950s uh, proposited Aranahoff uh, bomb effect. Lena can work from absolute zero, which is pretty much what it was doing when Piantelli observed um, uh, it, his reaction in 1989 at Palo de Siena on the 18th of August, I think it was, 1989, because he had a, a nearly liquid helium calling his biological experiment uh, to dense plasmas at any temperature. So this is not a process necessarily that needs the system to be hot. It just needs to be all of the material that can cohere is at exactly the same temperature. So you need to remove degrees of freedom. Okay, so the US Air Force on ball lightning in December 1993 in fusion technology, in one part of that thing, which you can go and read in your own time, they say, the fact that nature produces ball lightning without costly or complicated equipment is an encouraging indication that once we understand how ball lightning is formed, the equipment needed to produce a ball lightning fusion plasma will itself be simple and require only relatively simple containment equipment by current standards of magnetic fusion research. <laughs> You're a funny boy. <laughs> Uh, so the US Air Force on ball lining, um, they uh, did a study uh, that was commissioned in October 2001 to find out anyone in the world that knew anything about ball lining and related technologies. And the conclusion was uh, uh, the, the classified 1950s to 1960s Air Force funded research, which remained classified in that report, and the work of Ken Shoulders are the most promising areas for further study. Um, Shoulders began examining the plasma vortex, ACA force-free plasmoids work of Wells and Bostick from 1956, who was trying to get the H-bomb to be domestic fusion. Because he was originally influenced by the theories of elemental particle structures formed from vortical flows of a primeval substance. I'll skip to the next bit. Can possibly generate, sorry, the, the fact that an EV, that, that EVs are a form of micro ball lightning can, that can bore through e and even destroy by explosive impact solid materials can possibly generate more energy than is required to form them, are point sources of copious X-rays, and are compact, self-contained balls of condensed, high-density charge, demonstrates a clear need for further research to investigate their potential applications to weapons, defense technology, and aerospace propulsions. And the lead author there is Eric Davis, who is a colleague of Hal Kuthoff on the Sapphire project, which is what this talk is about, a kind of replication of that, but we. We, we did fast, dirty experiments and learned a lot quick, cheaply. So shoulders, um, so how do you make an exotic vacuum object and what is it? Any spark has an exotic vacuum object out in front of it. And you saw that in George Eagley's presentation going back to, I think, the last two centuries ago, the end of the 1800s. Um, an EVO can be conceived of as, uh, um, can be conceived of as an atom without a nucleus or as a spherical monopole oscillator. EVOs exhibit a soliton behavior with a number of densities equaling the Avogadro's number. These non-neutral electron uh, plasmoids can uh, contain various levels of binding energy, which exceeds that of atoms and allows the new, type, new types of reactions with matter. This monopole oscillator is the perfect generator for vector and scalar potential waves without contamination from either E or B fields, and you will see that behavior in the videos I will present you. These waves can be thought of as longitudinal waves in the vacuum. They are largely undetectable by the standard E and B detecting means, but are readily accessible in the uh, monopole world. So it would not be fair, uh, and uh, George mentioned him, to not mention George Messiatz at this point. He was ahead of the game long before Hutchison did his work that's 
that uh, spurred um, Ken Shoulders to do his investigation of what happened with Hutchison. But um, uh, he first reported in a US conference, I think in 1996, I've got the 1997 and the 2004 version of the paper linked in the presentation. But in the 1996 paper, you can see explicit descriptions of how to make uh, electrons, which are um, explosive electron emissions, okay? And I think you'll recognize every single way to do Lena. And it was in the paper in 1996. So you've got microprotrusions. That is how the Parkamorph 225-day reactor worked. You create these exotic vacuum objects. They can go and live in the, the liquid metal, and they can do the, the, the transmutation, even though it's a liquid. Mm -hmm. Dielectric inclusions. This is what you do on your wires, Chalani. You add sol gel. Uh, oxides and other uh, inorganic electric films, and that's what you will be doing at Conrad, I should imagine. You were talking about that to enhance your... Uh, screening energies. Absorbed gas layers, grain boundaries, we're going to see this in the exact process going on using the grain boundary example. Microparticles, oil vapor fracking problems, there's been problems in the, the fracking industry, uh, not, not the fracking industry, the, the fractioning of oil, and, and, and it was probably due to this. Edges of craters formed upon breakdowns, which is what you do when you pre-treat electrodes, and pores and cracks. Well, we've definitely heard that before. So I'm going to talk briefly a little bit more about the Solon patents. It was an electron, commercial electron beam furnace, the sort that um, David Hudson used to make a thumb-sized uh, tungsten electrode disappear instantly twice, with radiation that turned his glassware into dust in the far reaches of his lab. Um, spontaneously proceeding low temperature nuclear process with the excitation of self-sustaining controlled chain reactions of nuclear fusion. Functioning under conditions of combined electromagnetic, gravitational, and nuclear interactions in a mass of nuclear fuel generating directly in nuclear fuel coherent radiation and superconducting currents of magnetically charged particles, obtaining superconducting nuclear material and nuclear fusion product uh, with the chemical elements formed in the process. And I list all of the paramagnetic, low vapor pressure, high melting point, suitable materials that he used in his now free to use but awarded patent. So the Solon patents go on, uh, this process is accompanied by the occurrence of self-sustaining chain reactions with a participation in this process of composite particles of nuclei, protons and neutrons, external electrons, atoms and other elementary particles inside the nuclei. Ultimately, as established by the author, a spontaneous process proceeds in the volume of the liquid bath of metal, leading to the transition to a new aggregate state with the formation of superconducting superfluid nuclear substance and the nucleation of magnetically charged particles in it. The physical result of the process becomes the recording device and the detector. We have replicated every single observation of Solin in something that wasn't a big arc furnace, it was a very cheap device a number of years ago before I ever knew about Solon. Magnetic charges that automatically arise are maintained in its volume and they lead to the decay of protons and are catalysts for nuclear reactions. This has been observed by Homlid and it's been observed, I think, by one other party. So you've got meson stimulated transmutation and muon catalysis and you've got a whole smorgasbord of things you can do. With increasing uh, concentration of magnetic charges in the active medium, the intensity uh, of the course of the nuclear reactions increases spasmodically. This is achieved by creating conditions for self-compression, the exact same words of S.V. Adamenko and of um, Matsumoto, of the mass of superconducting nuclear condensate. And on the right, you've got the zirconium fuel, which is his preferred fuel, and the zirconium fuel afterwards. If you fire an electron at zirconium, in a, in a hydride or a deuterated environment, you're going to be doing this whether you like it or not, or have an opinion whether it's happening or not. Solin patterns. Due to the formation of the mobile active centers domains in the active medium, they have the form of hollow spheres and cylinders. Inside them, nuclear fusion reaction occurs. Now, that is from his 2001 patent. This is Matsumoto with the hollow spheres with a nuclear reaction occurring inside and converting the material into carbon which sprays out. This is on our Vega experiment in the electro uh, system. And then I talked about this uh, titanium in the explosive uh, um, coherent production of, of uh, crystals with voids and these structures that are coming out which have a cone 
and a rod. Magnetically charged particles are generated and accumulate with the generation of superconducting currents. Electromagnetic nuclear and gravitational forces are combined with the formation of coherent radiation, which was what burnt Piantelli in the 1990s on his arm when he started a reactor. Active centers whose shells are composed of superconducting uh, nuclear condensate rotate. You'll see the rotation, and the shell, in my view, is the inside of the double layer. Thus, active centers act as gravi gravimagnetic rotors in local zones. In the areas of their accumulation in the active medium, superconducting current, eddy currents, and remember I talked about that yesterday, I will show you multiple examples. I said it was important, ICCF 22. I didn't read this patent before then. And circular waves with white glow, white glow like the indium, uh, pulsations and local explosions. Orderly directed self-accelerating mass flows in the form of a cone and a cylinder arise. You have a cone and a cylinder. This is just a cone and this is a cylinder. This is his SEA. It's, it's obviously he had poorer equipment back in prior to 2001, but he has the cone here and the cylinder in the center. So it's just a diff different orientation of the same thing. And that is why they order their arrangement, as I said yesterday. So this is the pretzel or the magnetohydrodynamic structure that I found in the seven month running nickel hydrogen reactor uh, that produced, I think, 4.2 million electron volts, uh, um, uh, sorry, mega electron volts and 2.1 e uh, electron volts. God, I'm gonna get this wrong. A lot of energy. <laughs> you can go and look at that from my ICCF 22 presentation. Um, you can see it on this Matsumoto structure that was in the previous slide, and you can see this sketched onto the Solin 1992 patent. Active centers interacting with each other move and join, and then increase in size. This process has a self-regulating and resonant character. Under such conditions, nuclear transformations spontaneously activate, propagating from the central zones of the liquid bath to its peripheral. I'm not going to read the middle paragraph. Protrusions and depressions periodically occurring on its surface respond to the maxima and minima of the intensity and spontaneously generated alternating magnetic field and characterize the appearance of magnetic solitons of two different polarities in the resulting magnetic superconducting liquid. I have for now three years observed this on multiple systems in like from non-contact to uh, deuterium and just a heat one to cavitation, all kinds of things. I didn't know what it was. I put the data out there and then I translated this on August uh, last year. So this is his uh, image with all of the things you can expect to see recorded in your uh, uh, post uh, nuclear condensate fuel. So the Lion reactor here it used, we, because we saw diamonds in the beginning of um, uh, uh, 2013 on your wire, Chalani, I suggested the use of um, industrial diamonds because uh, in nickel or, or whatever, they come in nickel, tin to. And industrial diamonds are better for electron emission because they are, they've got nitrogen pollution and that is, it improves their emission of electrons. So this is the reactor. It was built by Looking for Heat, which was a venture of our good friend Alan Smith. And it's um, uh, two, we have a control and this, and it's just, uh, you have some constant, con not constant, you have copper wire just as a thermal bridge, but it was very important for the process, um, I believe. Uh, fused quartz tube, this is Cantal, or some other heater resistance wire, but Cantal. So here you can see, this is on a, a classic, so these are shoulders, um, exotic vacuum object bead ch chains, and this is a, a bead chain on the outs outside, outside of that quartz liner, quite a long way from the core. Uh, here is this triangle, this will become important, but this is one monopole that's starting to eat into the quartz. This is coming from the inside to the outside, and this is on the copper oxide. And in the flux loop of the monopole, you have either synthesized or transported material. In this case, I believe the calcium is synthesized. Uh, this is just copper oxide, and you've got the calcium there. This was an experiment I did two weeks ago using HHO in Switzerland. And uh, the idea is to use calcium because many systems like to fuse two and fission two 
uh, uh, calcium. It's doubly magic. It seems to be something pretty solid. So I wanted to use that as a substrate and um, see what would happen when we heated it with HHO. Because of limelight, it's something that's known. And because, of, because when you want to drive off the carbon dioxide, you know you've gone past, it's not that bad. <laughs> when you drive past, you have to go past 825 to 850 degrees C uh, to get the carbon dioxide off, and then it goes to cal cal calcium oxide. And then the limelight uh, temperature is about 2,000 to 2,200 degrees. And we got the limelight, so we know that we are we're seeing temperatures, or should be temperatures, of 2,200 degrees. And according to Parker Morph, that will synth synthesize lots of cold neutrinos. What you're seeing in Solon's pattern is the effect after a, um, a coherent center has blown up. And this is what you see. And the interesting thing is, I didn't expect this. I, I did expect silicon to be there because we observed a huge silicon line when we, when we started burning it. And I thought that that was going to be coming from um, a, a, another reaction, let's put it this way. Um, but we actually uh, found that it produced calcium, oxide, uh, calcium peroxide and silicon uh, when, the, uh, when it was exposed to the HHO and we got this uh, wave-like structure. You serious? Okay. I'm only started. <laughs> I, I'm not even anywhere close to the punchline. So, so these are the flux mirrors on the line reactor. Um, these are the um, uh, polar flux loops, and this is material that was ejected um, from one pole to another, and it's in this loop in the, in the system. And uh, it has a synthesized material. We've seen the monopole here before I showed you yesterday, and you've got the structure there. These are the monopoles that are on the inside of the quartz, and you can see that they have um, two, two poles, and when you've got one pole, it rams material into the surface and you get a spot. And when you've got the other pole, it pulls material away, but it, it leaves this very center unaffected. And when you've got the same pole together, you get material flow around the outside of, of the particular monopoles. And here we can see on the outside of the line reactor, well away from the core, a magnetohydrodynamic structure. And you can see this is on the inside, burning from the inside out. They are exactly the same as he observed. And on the, uh, the wire that is here, there is a deposit like this, and we will see this if, we ever, if I ever get a chance to present it <laughs> in, in the, um, another reactor. But this material is, is a vortical structure, and it has these crystals uh, which contain calcium which shouldn't be there. Uh, this is what you see. This is a 1950s demonstration of a solaton in water using a, a, a kind of mocked up wing. And you can see it matching the structure of the two structures that I've just referred to. And this is the soliton that I was talking about yesterday in the magnetohydrodynamic structure. And you can see the outside of the ball lightning that formed and this laser cut. You can see it's literally like it's cut by a laser. And that got me onto the idea of maybe it's amazing. And so here is a monopole. That's what it would look like when it goes into a surface because the, the core can only go 50% in. And this is on that same 10 yen coin. So you've got, a, this, this is on this axis and at 90 degrees orthogonal, you've got a much bigger uh, fractal structure of the ball lining. Anyway, this is coming in and if you uh, see here, the monopole comes in and it's eaten the copper and it's left this, the copper just on the rim that, that protrudes through. So this is in the Solin pattern again from 1992 and I will be able to show you live videos of these effects occurring. And this, this, this is the first uh, recording of strange radiation. He says it, when, it's when the, 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 the area that's doing self-collapse collapses, it shoots out these shock waves on the surface. But I think it's actually not just a shock wave, it is actually these particles, because we can, we can see this exact behavior. And in fact, all of the behaviors of all strange radiation, I will be able to show you today at some point. <laughs> uh, what does he say? Uh, yeah, uh, this is a, a ball lightning trace on a Hutchison sample. I was meant to show uh, the magnetic monopole theory that was suggested in the 1980s for how Hutchison achieved his effect by the military and how it occurs, but that, that, that will have to go into the slide that I publish. So this is just a bit of fun, and maybe I'll break at this point, but this is a Sumerian lampen, lantern, which is possibly as much as uh, 12,000 years old. 
and uh, it was an Iraqi museum. It has the Solin uh, uh, ordered structure on the top. Uh, it has the uh, uh, symbol of uh, uh, well-being and auspicious nature, um, in, which I lived with all over India. And the wonderful thing about it is because it's going around here, it's a coherence down to the point. It has the ring which you observe. It has the two particles out of coherence in relief, embossed rather. It goes round the loop, round the, the coherent direction, and it comes out in, in relief. So whoever made this mass-produced thing that produces light, a lantern, knew precisely how this technology worked. And here it is on a 1986 sample we, we've called the ball burn since we've had it. And you hear the, 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 see the magnetohydrodynamic structure. I call it yin and yang. And there is a mirror of this on every Indian temple. Uh, and you see the structure in this structure here. And this is the same structure you see here, again, on the quartz, um, where, you, where you get a pair. So they've done it so very well. It's absolutely brilliantly rendered 12,000 12, years ago. You've got to give it to them. Um, and this is on the Solin patent from 2001, exactly the same structure that we can create pretty much every time. And by the way, if you get the reactor and you put it into a, a net thing with x-rays after it's turned off, it produces these things on the x-ray film. Uh, so I'll leave it there, and um, I've probably got another two lots of that, so you can... <laughs> so if I have to stop, I have to stop. You miss all the fun bits. <laughs> okay. I haven't even got to the important bits. <laughs> I haven't even started. Bob, now it's better. Not perfect, but better. But you've missed everything that's important.